we are going to move on to our keynote address. I hope that you will sit back with, again, your cup of coffee um, or tea and enjoy a conversation between Maine Downtown Center Program Director Adam Burke and our keynote, Stacy Mitchell. There is plenty of time for audience questions. And again, you can put them in the chat at any time. We will be monitoring that. And so with that, I would like to introduce Stacy. Uh, Stacy Mitchell is the co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which produces research and develops policy to counter corporate control and build thriving, equitable communities. Does that language sound so familiar to our fellows program? Stacy has written extensively about the importance of independent businesses, the value of thriving local commercial districts, and the dangers of growing concentration of corporate power. Her articles and reports have influenced lawmakers, journalists, and advocates. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, Bloomberg, The Nation, and The New York Times. And she's the author of a book, Big Box Swindle, and several in-depth reports, including Monopoly Power and the Decline of Small Business and Amazon's Strang Stranglehold. Stacy has helped numerous communities adopt policies that strengthen and spur local business development while limiting the reach of corporate train chains. In 2019, she testified before Congress about Amazon's outsized market power and impact. In addition to her work at ILSR, Stacy serves on the board for the Maine Center for Economic Policy. We are lucky that she also lives right here in Portland, Maine. Adam, I'm going to have you and Stacy take it away, and I um, look forward to hearing their conversation. Hi, Stacy. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. Good morning, and good morning to everyone. I'm blown away by everything that's happening in Maine's downtowns. Pretty exciting stuff, even during these really difficult times, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been eight years since we've been on stage together when you gave your TEDx Diego talk about we can't shop our way to a better economy. So it's a pleasure to be with you here again. I know it's good to be in community with you. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could get us grounded a little bit more specifically in what the Institute for Local Self-Reliance does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, uh, we are a national research and advocacy organization um, and our idea of, of local self-reliance is really the idea that people should be able to exercise power over their lives, shape the future of their communities. You know, in a nutshell, that we have a vibrant democracy that really is rooted in place and in connections to one another. That's our vision. Um, and we think that one of the biggest threats to that vision is concentrated corporate power. We're really concerned about uh, the fact that in many sectors of our economy, we have a small number of corporations that are really dominant, um, that we are losing local economic systems, and that those big companies have a lot of power over our government and that they're weakening the community fabric. So to combat that, we, we focus um, in, in two, on two different things. Uh, one is that we work on changing policy to check corporate power and to really rein in and break up this concentration that we see. And then at the same time, we do a lot of work to um, lift up and promote strategies and policies at the local level that can rebuild local businesses, community banks. Um, we do a lot of work helping uh, cities build uh, municipally owned high-speed broadband networks, uh, local renewable power. Um, so we work in both directions, sort of challenging the big and then lifting up and, and promoting uh, the, the small. And so uh, we're uh, a, a relatively small organization. We're about 22 people and, and we work nationally. We're spread all over the place. We have a lot of staff in Minneapolis. We have a, a Washington DC office um, and then a very small office here in Portland. And could you say more about what you do there? Yeah, I'm the, um, the co-executive director. So I share the executive director seat. Um, and then I also run our independent business initiative. So we're organized into these program areas. We have an energy program and a broadband area and so program and so on. And I run the independent business initiative. So we're a, a small team of folks who focus on independent small businesses 
Um, that team includes Kennedy Smith that many folks uh, on this call might know who joined us about a year ago and, and used to be the uh, national uh, director of the National Main Street Center and of course is a huge leader in this field. So we're absolutely delighted to be uh, working with her and have her at the Institute. Um, and our team uh, at the at, with the Independent Business Program, we do a number of different things. We uh, do a lot of work on sort of local level policy and approaches that communities can use. So, for example, um, I've done some uh, we've done some really groundbreaking uh, research on dollar stores and the impact that they're having, uh, the ways that they're driving growing number of food deserts and undermining local grocers. And then we've developed a set of policies that communities across the country have been implementing to address that and to try to rebuild local um, food retail systems. Uh, we've done work on rising rents, another big issue that affects independent businesses in cities like Portland and, and all across the country. So we do a policy work on that. You know, the past year, of course, a lot of our focus at the local level has been helping to create resources and uh, models and policy ideas that, that communities can use to, to, to address the fallout of COVID and kind of get through this crisis. So we do local stuff and then we also do federal work. So in the fall, I put together a federal policy brief for the incoming Biden administration and, and the new Congress around like, what does the federal government need to do to strengthen small business? and local economies and have done some meetings with the transition team and uh, have been involved in, in helping to shape, shape some recommendations about around the small business administration and ways that we should change it. Um, and then lastly, I think a big area of focus for me uh, in recent years has been really sounding the, the alarm about concentrated power and in particular Amazon. Um, I have done uh, research on Amazon for, for many, many years and several years ago really became deeply concerned because it felt like they were sort of reaching their tentacles into all different parts of our economy, but sort of invisibly. I mean, everyone knew what Amazon was, but there was not a lot of reporting or focus on the company or a real sense of what, how, how far it was going and the kind of implications of it. And so we, we really stepped up our work on Amazon and have done a number of uh, significant research reports uh, on it. Um, and as Ann mentioned, testified before Congress last year and have been um, working to kind of rally people nationally to the idea that we need to revive our anti-monopoly policies and that Amazon really should be uh, one of the first targets <laughs> of that work. Well, we're all better for it. So thank you for all that work. I'm, I'm a sci-fi geek of sorts. And so when I hear what you do, I feel like you're, we're kind of in the matrix and like, I see one version of reality, but you see all the, all the code and the strings and what, what else is kind of programming that reality that I'm interacting with yeah. while I drive around. So thanks for, for all that you do and for your superpower of analysis and, uh, uh, and advocacy. Oh, thank you. That's a really nice thing to say, a nice way to put it. I, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, so from your unique super powered vantage point, uh, what did you see happening on main streets and for local businesses over the last year through the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is a community that obviously knows the story even better than I do. I mean, it, it, you know, we can use words like unprecedented and catastrophic um, to describe what has been going on. Um, the data I've seen says that overall small business revenue nationally is down by about a third. This has never happened in history. Um, never just had that sort of drop off and recessions are bad, but they're not like that. Um, I think that we've lost uh, more than 400,000 independent small businesses. And of course, businesses owned by people of color have been especially hard hit for a variety of reasons. And so like so much of this pandemic, um, COVID has really just laid bare and, and turbocharged a lot of the inequalities uh, in our economy and just, and just made them worse. I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful that it in sort of revealing them that it is maybe created some new impetus to, to actually address them. You know, we'll see going forward if that, if that happens. You know, back in March, we uh, pulled together a, a set of uh, allied organizations to really push around federal relief um, for independent businesses and called for, you know, direct funding through the treasury through IRS, just inject cash uh, to, to enable, to create a bridge, you know, while businesses had to be closed or, or were going through these substantial changes. 
Um, we didn't get that, though we did get forgivable loans, which you know have been a mixed bag, but you know at least something. Um, and you know, but but sort of disappointing in the sense that the, the federal policy response was much more robust for large companies uh, and more flimsy for uh, our local economies. And so again, sort of seeing policy kind of tip the scales, uh, you know, against main streets, against small businesses. So that's really concerning, um, you know, but at the same time, what has been so striking about this year and, and you know, we saw this in the, in the awards just now and, and some of the work that the fellows talked about is just how, you know, it has been a great example of how resilient and creative and adaptable communities are and, and, and local businesses are. Um, you know, that, that there is some advantage to smallness and localness, you know, not, you know, just all the ways in which businesses have pivoted and, and altered what they're doing. Um, you know, I've just been amazed that, you know, uh, things like, uh, uh, it, you know, in Colorado, reading about a, a pottery uh, studio uh, that, you know, can, can obviously no longer host classes. And so instead, as a, a model where they're delivering lumps of clay to people with, you know, online videos for different projects, so you can do them at home, you know, a hardware store in North Carolina that's doing, you know, virtual home repair, there are all these businesses that are using Facebook to do kind of curated uh video shopping through their stores. I mean, just, you know, on and on. And the mutual aid has been amazing. Um, businesses that are stepping up to help their communities, making meals for frontline workers and, you know, everything that we've seen. And also the, the, the mutual support among business owners. Um, you know, there are a number of cities now where restaurants have gotten together and created uh, cooperatively owned uh, uh, delivery businesses so that they're not, you know, dependent on in having to pay the high fees of, of DoorDash and the other big companies, but are, are doing it together for one another to, to support the whole restaurant sector. Um, you know, we've seen grocery stores carrying uh, prepared meals from re restaurants. So all of this evidence of why community matters and sort of the innate resilience at that at that local level, I think, has been um, really, really um, uh, important. I will just, uh, you know, sort of note and in, uh, and sort of close it, just noting that um, you know we did a, a nice report called "Safeguarding Small Businesses During the Pandemic: 26 Strategies for Local Leaders," which documented some of these these things that we were seeing on the ground that seemed to be working. And I, we organized that report into like first, like the most immediate things places need to do next and later. Um, and we're sort of now moving into the later stage. So, you know, what I, part of what I'm keeping an eye on, and I think people need to keep an eye on is what is, what are the key things during recovery? Um, and I think, you know, ongoing surveying and monitoring of businesses to sort of understand exactly what the needs are and how they're changing as we move into this, sort of next phase of where we are, thinking a lot about capital and the importance of community banks and making sure that we've got affordable loan capital for businesses to grow and for new businesses to get started uh, in, the, in the spaces created. Um, and the other thing I'm really interested in is property ownership. Um, I'm worried on the one hand that, especially in Portland, that we're gonna have these private equity firms that are gonna swoop in distressed properties and buy them up. And we're gonna have you know, lots of chain stores and that kind of thing. Um, at the same time, interest rates are really low. And so there is an interesting opportunity to help support businesses buying their buildings or community groups buying property like community land trust model uh, around commercial development. So some things that are on my mind as we as we move into this year. Yeah, that, uh, thanks for sharing all that. Uh, I'm <laughs> picking up a few things you're putting down and hearing both your concerns and thinking about the examples of where there's hope for uh, more resilient ways forward, particularly on the property ownership and thinking of, you know, there was a Bayside development that just opened here in Portland that I think is a pretty good example um, from somebody who's been part of Bayside for decades. Um, and that's focused, uh, it has like units for people that have experienced homelessness and it's focused on the creative uh, class, uh, things like that. But then there's great local developers that are involved in Biddeford and Skowhegan with projects that, you know, are, are just moving. And then there was the, uh, the cooperative and land trust that just uh, got a project here in Portland, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think over in the former ball field and uh, school property uh, that had to be demolished over by the, the four leaf clover. But um, 
Yeah, lots to get into there. I want to pick up on what you said about loss, because obviously this past year has been a tremendous amount of loss, and it's a little bit crazy for me to hear that number 400,000 know, small businesses lost, knowing that it's also the number of lives that have been lost up to this point due to COVID-19. And, um, you know, there's just been an extraordinary amount of grief that I don't even think we're, uh, in terms of that first, next and later, like we're still probably in the first phase of even reckoning with that level of grief. Um, but also when we were talking before this call, you mentioned something that was really interesting to me is that something about, you know, when, when we lose a local store, when we lose a local business, that there's kind of a conditioning that we've learned to write off that visceral feeling of grief that we have, that we lost that. Well, like, oh, that's, you know, just, that's natural. That, that's how capitalism works sort of thinking. And I'm just, could you bring us back into that? I'd love to hear more. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is, um, you know, we, you know, when we see a local business close, like when, when an independent pharmacy shuts down or a community bank uh, is gobbled up and disappears or a um, local grocer uh, goes out of business or a local farm, you know, when we see that, we're sort of conditioned to imagine that this is, that there's something inevitable about this, that small and local is just sort of inherently not as effective or efficient, that the big, the big guys outperform. Um, and that you know we might be nostalgic about these losses, but really it's kind of the price of, pro of progress, um, and we just sort of have to accept it. Um, and you know I think we as a society are really steeped in this idea that bigger is better, that bigger outperforms, and it's such a powerful idea that has really dominated um, thinking in America for several decades now. It's such a powerful idea that it distorts our ability to see, see clearly. You know, it functions as an as an ideology that that shapes how we see things. And I think if we can step back, especially in this moment when there is really new attention to the importance of independent businesses and to healthy local economies, if we can really step back and try to see the world with fresh eyes, we discover that that th these notions about bigness are not actually uh, always the case and often are not. We were, we've been furnished at just in the last couple of weeks with a really interesting kind of glaring example of this that is, is so glaring that people kind of can't ignore it, um, which is that as the federal government has been trying to get you know, vaccines out to the states and you know, into people's arms, um, there's been a lot of, there's been some variation at the state level to how much vaccination there's been. So nationally, about 55% of the vaccine that has been distributed has actually gotten into people's arms. And in most states are right around that 55%. You know, there's a little bit of variation in Maine, we're at 58%, right? But that's about where everybody is, except that there are these, a few outliers that are total outliers. So North Dakota, 87% of vaccine in people's arms. West Virginia, 84%, um, big differences, right? Um, and so the question is like, well, why, how did that, why is that? And it turns out that the federal government negotiated with CVS and Walgreens um, as part of the national plan, they would be the, doing some of the, the, the uh, initial vaccinations at nursing homes and care facilities um, across the country. Well, it turns out that North Dakota and West Virginia opted out of the federal plan and said, we're gonna do it with independent local pharmacies instead. And that has turned out to be far more effective that those pharmacies um, were able to jump in. They had relationships with the nursing homes. They, you know, they, they have done a much better and faster job of, of actually delivering those vaccines. And there's been a bunch of report, you know, a lot of national news outlets have been reporting on this in the last week or so. And a lot of it's kind of this gobsmacked, like dumbfounded, like West Virginia, how are they ahead of, you know, places, you know, how is it that, you know, old timey drugstores in West Virginia or, you know, that kind of thing, um, sort of surprise at rural places and surprise at small business being, being better. Um, but for, for me and for people who kind of study some of this stuff, it's no surprise at all. I mean, in fact, it's not just during vaccine rollouts that independent pharmacies are better. They are hands down better all the time. 
Um, we know that they have significantly lower prices according to Consumer Reports and others. They have faster service. They spend more time with patients. They deliver better healthcare advice. They do more screenings. 70% of independent pharmacies offer free home delivery. Most chains do not. Um, so, you know, you, you name the metric, they are actually better than CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, everybody else who operates a pharmacy. And you can take that, um, you know, you, we've done that same kind of analysis in a lot of different parts of the economy and kind of found the same thing. I mean, community banks are another example, like local small banks, um, they have lower fees better interest rates. And they also do a much better job of like financing the real economy. They direct more of their assets to loans that go to job creating local businesses versus the big banks, which do very little uh, actual productive lending, um, you know, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so again, by a lot of measures, local banks are just superior. They do a better job at what we need banks to, to be doing. Um, you know, broadband, the fastest, best, cheapest, fastest broadband in the country are uh, small networks run by cooperatives and municipalities. It's not Spectrum and, you know, the, the other big companies that are in the lead there. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's, you know, we, 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 uh, we're so steeped in that idea um, that we, it's hard to see these things, but, but there are, you know, once you sort of take off the blinders and go looking around, um, there are lots of examples in which uh, small and local enterprises outperform or deliver really distinct and important benefits that their big competitors can't match. Wow, it's, uh, it's good to hear that the, the data is lining up with both a main ethic and a main street ethic that local and independent does it better. <laughs> it's the way to go. That's really encouraging to hear and that's also um, the flip of the story that we've told it as, as you uh, pointed out. So if it's not necessarily true that our local businesses are not efficient, like big businesses are supposed to be, uh, and that our communities are in fact pretty resilient, why does it feel like we're still losing ground, you know, heading into a year into the pandemic here? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it, you know, this is the question, like if you, you know, if, if independent pharmacies are out competing, why are they disappearing? Why are they actually losing ground to CVS and Walgreens, right? That's the, that's the big question. And indeed, you know, we are losing independent pharmacies. Um, there are a growing number of places that are, that are pharmacy deserts now, like food deserts, and it tends to be um, rural places, including some parts of Maine and um, in urban neighborhoods uh, that are uh, predominantly African-American. Those are the places where we've really seen this uh, pretty extreme. Um, we've lost a lot of local banks. There are uh, one out of every three local banks that was operating 10 years ago is no longer here. Lots of counties now lack local banks uh, across the country. So again, like if these, if these uh, small and local enterprises outperform? Why are they disappearing? Um, and, and the answer that we've concluded in our research is that public policy has in, is in a variety of ways um, functioning to undermine small local enterprise and to shift the economy more to large corporations. So to talk about how that plays out in the pharmacy sector, just to be specific, there are these companies um, they're called pharmacy benefit managers, PBMs. And they are like the most powerful companies in the healthcare system that you've never heard of, you know? Um, but PBMs, uh, th what they do is your insurance company hires them to manage your prescription benefits. They decide which drugs are covered. They decide what, uh, you know, when a pharmacy dispenses that drug under your insurance, how much that pharmacy is paid and so on. There are three PBMs that control about 80% of the market nationally. All three of those PBMs own their own mail order pharmacy. So think about that for a minute. You've got companies that decide who gets paid what, um, who are actually competing with the pharmacies that depend on it. And so in fact, PBMs are steering customers to their own mail order and they're underpaying, under reimbursing independent pharmacies. The largest PBM is CVS, which of course owns the nation's largest chain of drugstores. Uh, CVS has been uh, reimbursing pharmacies actually in, in some cases below the cost that the pharmacy is paying for the drug, meaning they're losing money when they dispense that drug. 
And in some states, CVS has then been sending letters to those pharmacies and saying, gosh, we know it's really hard to be an independent pharmacy these days. Would you like to sell your business to CVS? I mean, this is just, you know, you when you look at this on its face, any reasonable person is like, this is totally anti-competitive. This is a this is a, a set of giant companies you not competing on the merits, but using their market power to push out their smaller rivals. Um, and we have antitrust laws that prohibit this, but we've stopped enforcing them. We've altered uh, how we interpret them in ways where there are just rampant market power abuses. Um, what I just described with, with pharmacies is something we, we see in one industry after, after another. Um, and you know, once you, as, as we've documented in a lot of our work, you start looking around and you discover that this is, you know, it's the, it's the antitrust laws, it's the way that our banking policy favors the big banks and in effect subsidizes them uh, and makes it harder for local banks to exist. It's the way our agriculture, you know, the farm bill channels the vast majority of its subsidies to very large uh, farms, uh, not to, to smaller farms and on and on. Um, and not just at the federal level, you know, at the state level, you know, Maine, we, we give tax breaks to Walmart, you know, every year they have, they have sort of special tax access. Um, at the local level, there are lots of ways in which land use and economic development policies often favor the big guys at the expense of the small. So, you know, it, it, this is really, we, we've tilted the playing field and we're getting exactly the outcome we've designed policy for. Um, and, and the trick I think right now is to actually see that instead of having the sort of assumption that the reason small is disappearing is because it can't compete. And so, you know, this is really kind of the focus of our work is how do you illuminate those, those policy dynamics and those larger structures? And then how do you advocate effectively for, for changing them? You got me on a seesaw at this point, Stacey. I've been going back and forth between like, yeah, main streets and downtowns are the vanguard of American democracy. Like, yeah, <laughs> we're doing it. To like, oh my gosh, <laughs> corporate control is strangling us and making it impossible to to succeed in some way. So uh, please bring the light back in. What are, what are some opportunities this year that, that you know of that, uh, that we can take advantage of or we can get behind or we can implement? So I'm actually, I think we're in, I, I feel more optimistic now than I have really ever since I've been doing this work. I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, and the reason is that there are a lot more people seeing this now. Um, and we're seeing new academic research, new journalism, policymakers are looking at this. There's just really been you know, a lot of sort of eye-opening, if you will, in the, in the last few years. One of the areas that I'm spending a lot of time right now, and I, and I really hope that the main downtown community uh, will get involved in in the coming year, because I think we have a really important opportunity, is around antitrust policy. Um, you know, we have very strong laws that we implemented, uh, you know, around 100 years ago, a series of laws that are designed to disperse economic power and ensure that um, uh, small and mid-sized businesses have an equal shot and that um, we have you know, economic vitality across the country and that we don't have concentrations of power that threaten uh, democracy. Like th that is the purposes of our antitrust laws. We have very good laws and they're all still on the books. Um, but in the 1970s and 80s, there was a kind of shift in thinking and, and those laws were reinterpreted by the enforcement agencies and by the courts in such a way that we really just turned them on their head and they no longer function the way that they're supposed to. Um, you know, and I won't, I won't go too far down the road of, of, of explaining all of that, but there is now a very strong movement afoot to re, um, reinvigorate those laws. Uh, and I think would be one of the most effective things that we could do for restoring local economic vitality and not always being in the position that I, I feel like we have been in the last you know, 25 years of fighting a kind of uphill battle against these larger structures that are always sort of coming down at us. Um, so, you know, uh, where this has been playing out has been particularly in Congress. So over the last 15 months, the uh, House Antitrust Subcommittee had, had conducted this really in-depth comprehensive investigation looking particularly at the dominant digital platforms, meaning 
uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. Uh, but through that lens, looking at how antitrust policy has gone wrong. And the report that they produced, I mean, they, they gathered millions of documents and testimony and, and witnesses, hundreds and hundreds of interviews and so on. I mean, it's a very in-depth piece of work. They released the report in October. It's about 500 pages. It found that uh, Amazon, quote, has monopoly power and has engaged in extensive anti-competitive conduct and details exactly how that's happening. Um, and then the committee goes on to call for legislation to address monopoly power across the economy and to restore a fair playing field for independent businesses, um, including by breaking up and regulating uh, Amazon. So I'm really encouraged. Um, you know, we, we haven't talked too much about Amazon, but I think it's one of the biggest threats that we face uh, and is really uh, a different kind of monopoly that is far more dangerous even than, than Walmart. Um, and we need to think about both breaking up the company and, and regulating it. And there's a real movement afoot now to do that and in the process to re reinvigorate antitrust overall. So the report had about 15 policy recommendations. I think that's right. Had a bunch of policy recommendations like for legislation that Congress needs to enact. And we are expecting this year to have bills reflecting every single one of those recommendations. And we're gearing up for, uh, you know, for, for uh, passing them. That's what we wanna do in both the House and the Senate. And so we're gonna need a lot of voices on the ground so that members of Congress and senators actually understand that there's widespread support for doing this. Well, thank you for doing that. We'll keep our, our eyes open for those bills as they come come through. Um, we're going to take some audience Q and A in just a moment. Nan's going to field those, and before that, I'm just I'm going to ask you two final questions for myself before I say goodbye. The uh, first one's a hard one, and the second one's a hard one, but in an easier kind of way. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the first one is you highlighted a few times in our conversation the issues of inequities that have been faced, you know, the number of uh, businesses that have been owned by uh, uh, black people or people of color close to disproportionately access to capital is, uh, you know, restricted uh, along those uh, social race lines. So I'm just curious if you've seen examples of what people have done to change those outcomes, you know, to do some equity centered work during this time? That's my, my first hard one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have seen a, a, quite a number of communities that in response to COVID in setting up local relief programs have prioritized um, entrepreneurs of color. Uh, I think that's been really important to do. And I suspect that we'll see in those communities that they will recover faster uh, economically and more, and they'll recover more equitably. Um, one of the problems with the, the, the approach of the PPP uh, loans was that they were delivered through the banking system, obviously, um, rather than, than what we had advocated, which was a sort of direct cash infusion from the federal government to all uh, businesses affected. Because they went through the banking system, it was really uneven, um, really uneven access. And businesses that didn't have a lending relationship with a bank were very much more, much more likely to be just left out and never actually be able to get those for, forgivable loans. And that meant that PPP uh, sidelined uh, a lot of immigrant owned businesses, women owned businesses, um, and, and businesses owned by black and brown entrepreneurs. So just, you know, just exacerbated, um, uh, you know, the, the wealth inequality. So cities um, and, and, and towns have, have, in some cases, bridged those gaps. And we document some of those in the, in the report that I mentioned, um, where they've stepped up and with their own relief programs, have really prioritized or they have through local uh, community organizations and others done a lot of outreach and assistance to make sure that those federal programs are, are getting to businesses that, that need them in an, in an equitable way. So that's been, been encouraging. I think moving forward, um, I mentioned that we've, we've been looking at how to reform the Small Business Administration, um, which is an agency that's really in the spotlight because of all the PPP stuff. So I think there's a real opportunity around that would really love to hear from um, from you know the various Main Street groups across Maine. If you have interactions with SBA, 
we're just taking we're taking all input at this moment about about people's experiences. But I think one of the recommendations that we're going to make in our report is going to be that that the 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 loan guarantee programs there needs to be a carve out. There needs to be a, a, a substantial share of those loans that are directed to very small businesses, to rural businesses, to people of color businesses women, you know, that we need to, right now they're skewed in the wrong direction and we need to just actually, Congress needs to step in and say this much of the, the funding needs to go here in this direction. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and I see lots of good questions coming in. So folks, please keep dropping them in while I ask one last question. And uh, what you just said, Stacey, lines up with what I've been understanding, which part of it was getting specific, right? So the, like disaggregating the data first and foremost, and then getting specific about um, how the, the funds were going to go out and then thinking about those channels. So that's interesting to hear about, you know, banks uh, versus directly through the IRS. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's my <laughs> hard, easy question. So uh, in, in the <laughs> immortal words of Biddeford entrepreneur uh, who created the shirts that say, just a kid from Maine. I know you're just a kid from Maine. Uh, and uh, you're also a, a Portland kid. So what is a business that is no longer here in Portland that, that you miss the most? Oh, uh, well, that's, that's actually, uh, you know, it, it takes me no time at all to come to an answer, which is video port. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. video port, I know we're all streaming now. And so there's a way in which, um, you know, that it's just, that the business itself is no longer relevant, but as an institution in Portland, Videoport was, it was the best independent video store in the country. And I, I was traveling a lot during the mid aughts. And so I got to, I got to test that out by going into in, independent video stores everywhere. And we really had the best video store um, staffed by people who loved movies and the conversations that I had in Videoport about movies and also just as a community hub, it was like the place you could go if you'd lost track of someone and be like, hey, you know, have you seen so-and-so, you know, and, and what are they up to these days? Um, I just love that place. And it was really, I miss it. I miss it a lot. I do too. That's, that's my answer as well. And uh, somewhere as a side project, I want to do a documentary on the phenomenon of regulars. I think it's a, a common experience that deserves to be explored further. So maybe you and I can do that together someday. But thanks for your, your time today in the conversation. And I'm gonna hand things over to Anne to bring some questions forward from our community here today. Thanks, Adam. It's always so great to chat with you. You too, Stacy. Talk great. soon. Great. Um, thanks, Stacy. That was great. I was a fan of video port too. Um, so we do have some questions here this morning, uh, and you really do have the superpowers um, of analysis, as Adam said. That was a great term of, end of endearment for you. So um, let's see. Our first question from Jane Palmer in Bath, one of our advisory council members, says, nice to hear your words of wisdom again, Stacy. What major changes outside of COVID since the early 2000s are you most concerned with or pleased with for small businesses in Maine specifically? Um, and you certainly did reference the antitrust policy, um, but do you have anything else to add to her question? Um, yeah, I mean, I will, uh, in some ways, just say again, I guess that I, I, the thing I'm most concerned about is Amazon. Um, you know, Amazon increasingly controls the infrastructure for commerce. Um, you know, if you, they, they are 50% of all online shopping and they're over 60% of online search, meaning that people who are want to buy something online are starting at Amazon rather than at a search engine. And that sets up a very difficult dynamic um, where, uh, you know, it used to be that people would go to a Google or go to another search engine and type in running shoes or um, a toy train or whatever it was that they were looking for. And they would get a lot of results, including for local businesses uh, as well as Amazon in, the, in those results. When they're starting right at Amazon, it creates a very difficult um, uh, challenge for independent businesses because they have to decide, do I continue to sell online through my own website? You know, hanging my shingle out on a, on a road that is less and less traveled um, where there's, you know, fewer and fewer people over time who are actually even gonna encounter my business that way. 
Um, or do I become a seller on Amazon? Do I become a third party seller on Amazon's platform? And once you've done that, um, you know, you really can't succeed as a seller. Um, the way that Amazon has set it up, it's a great way for them to learn about hot new products, to steal your best ideas, to own your customers, and all the while to levy a really steep fee on your, on your trade. Um, through the fees that it charges sellers and the, and the huge cut of their of their revenue that it takes, this is This is very um, analogous to the railroads back 120 years ago. The railroads came along and were this whole new way of distributing goods, revolutionized everything. Um, the technology was great. Online commerce has a lot of great aspects of it. It's not about the technology. In the case of the railroads, you had a handful of industrialists who gained control over the railroad lines and used that control to privilege their own businesses. Standard Oil was one example. Said, you know, competing oil companies, sorry, you're not going to be able to get your oil to market because I own the rails and I'm just going to put Standard Oil on. You know, that kind of thing happened uh, in a lot of different ways. And Congress stepped in and said, look, if you own the rails, you can't have an interest in any other kind of commodity that relies on the rails. You have to be a neutral. Uh, player, uh, because you're you're part of this core infrastructure that lots of businesses need. We need to do that with with Amazon's platform. We need to take the same approach, uh, and so that is my biggest concern because you know it is through our surveys it is the number one threat to independent businesses in their own in their own view. You know, and here in Maine, we of course have no Amazon warehouses or facilities, so we're only experiencing a loss of economic activity uh, as, a, as a result of that. And, you know, I'm in favor of, of businesses being able to both sell in person and sell online and, and mix those two things together, but it depends on the online part of it being an open market where everyone has a chance to compete fairly and not, and not have this powerful gatekeeper um, that controls it. I'm trying to think, I think I just to, to briefly say, and I know I'm giving a long answer here, but on the hopeful part, um, I think again, just to underscore, I am, I am really more optimistic as bigger as these challenges are, the clarity with which policy, I, mean, I didn't used to do any federal work at all because you couldn't get any traction on any of this stuff at the federal level. So our strategy was we'll work at the local level and we'll try to do what we can there. And meanwhile, there are these sort of bigger policy strategies. Now there's a lot of opportunity um, because there is um, there is just growing concern about all of these issues nationally and with uh, with those uh, federal federal level lawmakers and so on. And so uh, I, I really do think we're going to see some movement on this, and that that we're going to win. That we're on the upside uh, of these issues. Great, thank you. I love your comparison. Um, to the history of the railroad industry. It's fascinating. Um, question um, uh, in the chat, could you talk about any early signs of increase in startup activity in Maine or elsewhere that may be fueled by the disruption of COVID? We're hearing so much about our COVIDpreneurs here and elsewhere, and we know that this disruption is not leading to increased educational enrollment like other economic downturns have. Is there any data or measurement that we can be matching, I'm sorry, that we can be watching to better understand whether more people are taking this chance to launch a business? And this is from Maggie Drummond Ball at Maine Community Foundation, who has been funding um, the work that we get to do in our entrepreneur pilot communities. Yeah, that's such an excellent question. Um, there, we will see data eventually sort of trickle out around startups. I'm not sure that there's anything that that I'm aware of that we can watch in real time, but I suspect that that's a phenomenon that's happening. And and one of the reasons that I think um, an important focus in the coming months this year. Um, is gonna be around thinking about capital and technical assistance. Um, and what is it that we can really do as a state and, and a set of communities to make sure that those entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs have the support they need to succeed and have the, the capital that they need uh, to succeed. And so, you know, looking at how are our community banks and credit unions doing? What are the, the uh, loan funds and equity investment options that are available? Uh, to independent businesses. Um, and then I think that the technical support and the know-how is also you know, really the other critical piece. 
Uh, and then as Adam, I think, you know, rightly brought up, how do we apply like an equity lens um, and framework to, to all of that, I think is, is gonna be uh, absolutely critical. And I hope that, that state policymakers and everyone else involved in economic development is gonna be, be, gonna be focused on that. That's great. Um, and I'm glad to hear that. That is the um, work we are focusing on in those pilot projects is really looking at um, their social capital, their technical assistance, and their capital without a doubt to create a successful ecosystem. Um, so we'll hopefully see some more research coming out um, on uh, Maggie's uh, question. Um, let's see, we have time for a couple more questions. So I'm gonna read you another one. Um, so much of the focus on buying local seems to be putting the onus on individuals and individual buying behavior. With events like the pandemic, many people need to make their money go further and buy the lowest cost products. What can we do as individuals, small businesses and nonprofits beyond our role as consumers to help push back against this anti-competitive behavior by large corporations? Yeah, it's such a great question. You know, so, so often the, um, you know, like we, we sort of, it feels like the onus is on us as individuals to solve these problems. And, and it's not, it's not on us. Um, you know, we are the, the choices that we have and our, our ability to uh, are really framed, are really framed and determined and constrained um, by all of these larger forces. I think, you know, one of the things that is important in, in thinking about how we um, sh change the direction of the economy is to always go to what is the thing I can do as a citizen and as a member of, the, of, of my community as opposed to what I can do as a consumer. Because um, I don't think we're very powerful as consumers and we don't always have the options and we're constrained by a, a lot of things uh, in, terms of those, in, in terms of those choices. So I, I really love the, the framing of the, of the question and, and, and think it's right. Um, I do really believe that whether we succeed at the federal level around antitrust, around you know, some of the issues around access to capital in terms of banking reform that would, would free up a lot more capital at the local level uh, than we have now. Um, you know, some of those big sort of structural uh, issues that make, uh, make, it, make it more of an uphill um, fight to reinvigorate our communities. So the key to actually, there is momentum on those and whether we're able to push them uh, over the top and, and, and succeed in changing policy is really gonna depend on whether members of Congress are actually hearing from people on the ground. You know, if this is an issue that just sort of lives in the national newspapers and kind of lives in DC policy circles, we're not gonna win. What's gonna make the difference is if groups of uh, Main Street leaders and small business owners are meeting with Susan Collins and Angus King and others and saying, here is how these changes to policies and, and these proposals affect us. Um, here's what this actually means for Maine. Uh, letters to the editor in local newspapers. You know, all of that kind of stuff is what's going to make the difference between whether we succeed or not on these issues. That's great. It sounds like you've given us um... Uh, what we need to work on in 2021, us working uh, with ILSR and really thinking about what we can do from an advocacy standpoint with our 25 local programs here in Maine to make sure that our federal representatives have heard us on this issue. So we look forward to that. 